Hi, I'm Carlo Poggio and I'm pleased to be here on Dental XP. I would like to thank Maurice Salama for inviting me to join this community. And uh, the topic of this presentation is going to be occlusion in implant dentistry. Occlusion in, in implant dentistry is something that deals with two big topics. One, of course, is implants, and implants are very popular topics nowadays. We all like to go to meetings and to see clinical cases. We all like to spend time learning and discussing about the issue of implants in clinical practice. So we, we have a lot of interest for surgery. We know and we like to learn how to do and perform our surgeries. There is a lot of interest in the way to manage soft tissues. So we like to spend time learning how to do, how to properly manage our soft tissues, to properly place implants, so to have a good looking appearance. We like also to talk about other issues related to implants, for example, interdisciplinary management. We like to see how we can treat our patients with implants and with orthodontics, for example, with extrusion, as Maurice Salama taught us many years ago, like in this patient where we had extrusion of this upper central, and then it is replaced with an implant. And through this interdisciplinary management, we can achieve uh, good results. Most of all, we like to see and to talk about aesthetics with implants, so we like to spend time discussing about different materials, different kind of abutments, different kind of crowns we can perform, and we know that we can give good quality results to our patients. Then, of course, there is occlusion, and occlusion is it's a part of the game with the implants. And the topic of occlusion is something that is related to every specialty in dentistry. And with the implants, we would like to talk about occlusion just looking at night picture, nice pictures. And what is going in dentistry in these days is something that reminds me of a statement by the artist Andy Warhol. I never read, I just look at pictures. But unfortunately, when we talk about occlusion, there is a dark side, and this dark side is made by literature. We have a lot of literature. And just to talk about implants and occlusion, we have several papers, all done in recent year, all of very good quality. And we must somehow deal with what this paper are saying to us. And most of all, because many of these advice and these guidelines are controversial so there is one saying one thing that is very very important to achieve success and another paper usually is saying a different thing and of course also that one is very important to achieve success but the things they are saying most of the time are controversial so Dealing with our topic of occlusion on implants, a brief outline of this presentation is this one. We are going to give a, a very short look at current literature. We, we have to do that. We are going also to discuss a little bit about what has happened to occlusion in recent years, because we all know that many concepts have changed in the last decades about occlusion. And what we should we consider with occlusion on our implants? There are basically two issues we are going to discuss, and I have chosen the term software and hardware issues to define some specific problems we have on implants we do not have on natural dentition. And another hot topic is what is the effect of occlusal load or overload, excessive load, on osseointegration. Does it affect osseointegration? Is it going to change the bone implant contact? And what is happening with occlusion when there is some peri-implant microbial infection? We all know that peri-implant microbial infection has a strong effect on our implants. And so what is happening when there is also some overload coming maybe for, from a not so good occlusal relationship? And, of course, we are going to draw some conclusions. As you all notice, the topic of occlusion is very controversial, so these conclusions are coming from many different uh, 
uh, issues we are going to see. When we look at literature, we have several good quality papers, all done in the last decade, and we have several. We are going to look at several reviews. This is a review in 2002 about good occlusal practice with implant borne prosthesis. And if we look at the summary of occlusal guidelines they are giving, we will just look at. We will just try to highlight some points in these papers. They are giving an advice, which is. The occlusal table should be designed not to overload the bone implant interface. And if we look at this statement, what we think is that the bone implant interface is the weakest point of the system. Is it true? We are going to discuss about this. Another paper, this is a very popular one made in 2005 by Kim. These are clinical guidelines for implant therapy, occlusal considerations in implant therapy. And they are giving specific advice for different clinical conditions like posterior fixed prosthesis, single implant prosthesis. They give advice for treatment when, where there is poor quality of bone or where there is grafting. And some of these advice, some of these guidelines are very popular. For example, for single implant prosthesis, the advice is to have light contact at heavy bite and no contact at light bite. And when we deal with other clinical conditions in the same paper, for example, full arch fixed prosthesis, the advice is to have infra occlusion in cantilever segment, 100 microns, and to have freedom in centric, 1, 1.5 microns. And in posterior fixed prosthesis, central contacts, narrow occlusal tables, flat cusps, minimize cantilever. In the same year we have another paper. This is evidence-based consideration for removable and dental implant occlusion, a literature review. So if it is evidence-based it should be a very good paper. But the problem is that the evidence they are talking about is evidence coming from expert opinion in vitro studies or evidence coming from expert opinion in vitro studies and animal studies. And the problem with this is that actually when we talk about evidence-based dentistry, what we need is clinical evidence, because evidence is that coming from controlled clinical studies. And to talk about evidence when we are dealing with expert opinions, in vitro studies, animal studies, it's somehow misleading. So if we want to make a joke about this, a take-home message of this paper is that removable prosthesis is not an alternative to implants when treating an animal, because we have evidence from animal studies for implant prosthesis, and we do not have evidence from animal studies for removable prosthesis, but of course this is nonsense. In 2007, we have a good quality review by Klinenberg, the basis for using a particular occlusal design in tooth and implant bone reconstructions. And as usually, there are several guidelines for occlusal scheme design, and some of these guidelines, for example, are about freedom in centric, they are about clearance with shim stock 10 microns clearance, so they give a specific value of clearance. And for single implant crowns, the shim stock clearance also here is 10 microns. In 2008, another paper, guidelines for occlusion strategy, another review, and in this case they are giving advice for specific clearance values for different conditions. For example, in single missing tooth with single imp tooth implants, the advice is to have 30 microns clearance. So this is three times more than the previous paper. And the advice is also for different conditions. If the canine is present, if the canine is absent, and the advice is to have 30 or 30 to 50 microns of clearance. And then, of course, in full arch prosthesis, there is no clearance, there is contact, because there is nothing different we can do. In 2008, we have another review by Martin Gross from Tel Aviv University, Occlusion in Implant Dentistry, and this is 
called a review of literature of prosthetic determinants and current concepts. And current concepts, this is a good statement because we are talking about concepts rather than evidence up to date. There is a table for single tooth implant supported restorations and for example they say that we have point centric or freedom in centric, one 1.5 millimeters. So there's no difference according to this review in using point centric or freedom in centric occlusal scheme. And in the same paper, there is another table. You're not supposed, of course, to read everything here, but you can read the full paper. And this table has a term which is coming many, many times, and this term is controversial. And controversial means that we do not have evidence to support any specific statement. So this is a very good quality paper because it describes what is actually available evidence, a lot of controversies. And another very good thing in this paper is, is that it gives you information about individual clinical determinants, a lot of different issues, skeletal relation, implant distribution, vertical dimension, interaction distance, crown implant ratio, aesthetic plane orientation, and all these issues have to be taken into account to design a specific occlusion in a patient. So there is not a cookbook approach giving you a single method, a single model, which is okay for every situation, but you must take into consideration many different issues for each patient. And this is a very good way of thinking. Then the last paper, the last review we are considering in 2009 is a paper by Gunnar Carlson about dental occlusion. And Gunnar Carlson is a very important person in prosthodontics. He has been a teacher of prosthodontics in Gothenburg for many, many years. So a person with a huge experience. And in his conclusion, what is he saying about occlusion, occlusion and implants? Most probably occlusal factors and details of occlusion are of minor importance for the treatment outcome of implant restorations. So if someone with such an experience is saying that occlusion is of minor importance, probably we could stop our talk now and go on to another, another discussion, another topic. The real problem is that, as we all know, with occlusion we have had some changes in recent decades. And what was considered very important many years ago now is somehow different. We, ha we have even some problems of definition with occlusion. We have, of course, definitions coming from the glossary of prosthodontic terms. So occlusion, for example, is the act of closure or the static relationship between the opposing surfaces of the teeth. But as you all realize, it's very different to talk about a static relation of these single crowns on the model before they are cemented, and to talk about the static relation between the same single crowns after they have been cemented into a patient mouth, and nothing is going to be really static in this condition. The problem with definition is that usually occlusion is defined with several other terms which are going with the, with the term occlusion. So we are talking about functional, we are talking about pathological occlusion, we are talking about many different uh, uh, terms with occlusion. And the first or, or one of the first problems with occlusion terms is that some of these definitions come from the orthodontic literature, the orthodontic history. For example, we used to, to have a term malocclusion, which is a term in need of cropping or a definition, and it comes, of course, from orthodontics. And when we are dealing with prosthodontic and occlusion, we have to consider that most of the things we are doing on our rehabilitations, on our treatments, are empirical based. There is no scientific evidence. There are no scientific facts to support specific 
schemes or specific theories. This all comes from experience and from the history of prosonotic treatments. When we are talking about, for example, what is a normal occlusion, we have several different uh, way of thinking. We can, we can go from a specific model of normal occlusion, which is the one coming from example from the studies of Robert Lee, and he gave a description of a very specific model with specific length for each single tooth. And this model is really an aesthetic one, but is this normal? Is this something that we have to treat every patient to do? We have, on the other hand, other definition of what is normal in occlusion. For example, the definition coming from the studies by Henry Bayron, and he published a famous paper in '73 in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry about occlusion, and most of his material came from studies he did in the 60s on Australian Aborigines and he show us that normal occlusion is even this one with a lot of wear but it's a functioning occlusion so we can have a normal occlusion with a very wide range of different conditions of different morphological conditions and this two way of thinking are, are just too extreme that we have then there are there are a lot of different ways of thinking and one of the important facts we have to consider when we look at what is normal what is ideal what we have to look for is what comes from recent literature about the association of morphological features with function and dysfunction with temporomandibular disorders and we know from several papers that no significant association of factors of functional occlusion with temporomandibular disorders are identifiable and this is for example a very large population-based study so with a very good quality of research so coming back to implants we have our patients we have all the literature so what to do with our patient what to do to, to do with occlusion on implants. The first thing to realize is that of course tooth and implant are different. There are several differences. This is a good table coming from the Kim 2005 paper and the differences of course can go from the periodontal ligament versus osseointegration, integration, the presence of periodontal mechanoreceptors, no mechanoreceptors coming from the periodontium, Tactis, tactile sensitivity is quite different, the axial mobility is quite different, and there are several other differences. And, of course, tooth and implant are, is different. The second thing to consider is, can we talk about occlusion on tooth versus occlusion on implant? Actually, we have cases where we have occlusion on implants and no, no teeth at all. But in most of our clinical practice, we have to consider patients treated with prosthodontic rehabilitation on implants and on, tooth, on teeth. We have to consider a patient with implants and natural dentition. We have to consider patients with implants and removable prosthesis. And we have, of course, to consider patients with single implants and a full natural dentition. So what is the difference? It is not a difference in terms of implants and teeth. It's much more a difference in terms of small versus larger rehabilitation. So we have cases where we have one implant or one crown, and we have cases where we have all implants or all crowns and we have cases so where we have to treat the whole rehabilitation of the mouth and these are really different so the difference basically is in instruments the difference is in different things we have to consider when we are treating a small case or a larger case and we should talk about we should talk a little bit about critical thinking on occlusion and we should consider how much science there is in occlusion in 2012. 
somehow we deal now with occlusion and TMD. There are, of course, some statements about occlusion and perio. There is not so much about restoring occlusion from a scientific standpoint. And another issue is the existence of a reference model, an ideal reference model or, or natural reference model. And the problem is when to choose between ideal treatments or natural treatments. So when to change everything or when to adapt to the existing conditions. And finally, we should have some talk about which instruments are necessary in clinical practice for diagnosis, for therapy, for evaluation of results. But all this would be quite long and going much far from the topic of implant and occlusion. So, to make a long sh story short, I just give you a statement coming from Carson. Conflicting opinion exists concerning much of these procedures in clinical dentistry related to occlusion, and mainly this is due to a scarcity of good studies with unambiguous results. So, all these topics are really controversial. When we talk about implants and occlusion, do we have some evidence-based data? So, actually, we do have small pieces of evidence. For example, we have a paper about evaluation of two different occlusal schemes with implant over dentures in 2008, and this is a very good quality paper, randomized clinical trial, comparing physiologic occlusion or lingualized occlusion. And this is good quality, but the number of participants is very small and it is related to a topic, removable overdentures, which is quite easy to study, while most of what we are doing in clinical practice, fixed prosthodontics on implants, is really difficult to study in clinical trials. So probably we will not have evidence for decades, for a lot of time.